What? That's fancy pants. I think it looks like a... Whoa, color? No. <laughs> it's got music! <laughs> it's got a face on it. We could just sit on the side of the bank and listen. <laughs> what? 6529. There's no steady state of the Great Basin. Like, it's a highly variable place. These fish have been here for millions and millions of years under tremendous change. I mean, you know, most of the northern Lahontan Basin was under pluvial Lake Lahontan, this enormous lake where this fish was the top predator and grew to enormous sizes and it's just a totally different landscape than we see today. Lahontan cutthroat trout are so amazing. They really, they're unique. Um, we now know that they're a lot older than had historically been understood. Everything that Northern Nevada is about, the resiliency, the harsh landscape, and the fact that these fish have persisted here, to me, is truly incredible. We're so far and remote from areas that you have to be really well planned out. And that's where Jason Barnes is phenomenal. I mean, he lives, breathes, and it's, it's all he thinks about are Lahontan cutthroat trout. He loves his fish. He's incredibly passionate about it. And everything about his life is, is these fish. So I didn't even know that much about Lahontan cutthroat trout. I didn't, I didn't know anything about them. I didn't grow up hearing about them. I actually started out working on Walker Lake in the last year and a half that there were ever fish in there. So I literally, you know, I fished that place with my grandpa and I knew Lahontan Cutthroat Trout from that. I knew Pyramid Lake, but I was there and I, and I was working on Walker Lake and I got to watch those Lahontan Cutthroat Trout just blink out. And then, uh, then the chubs went and then the bugs went. And, you know, through all this, there was, there wasn't many people who were champions for this fish. And, uh, and I think because of the way I grew up, you know, it was, I kind of had compassion for them and um, that turned into a passion and I'm like, this fish is going to be my mission. It's one of the things that my understanding of LCT has really brought me to is the biggest threat to these fish is, the, is their lack of ability to move around. This project started with someone much smarter than me. It started with Helen. She was aware that people were moving fish around and studying the impacts on genetics. Keep track of how many fish we're pulling out to. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Okay, so we have one day. Where we can, the main goal of all of the partners involved here and in, in all of our work on trout is to restore migratory big connected systems. I mean, that's what we need to be doing. I've been working on this fish for a long time, did my dissertation, looking at landscape genetics and how the fish sort of sort out on a landscape and how they, when they're in connected habitat, how they form these migratory life histories. And so they'll move out of the headwaters and down into bigger main stem rivers um, to overwinter and grow and then move back up into their natal streams. And it's a really important part of the resiliency these populations have over time. Genetic diversity is basically the, the toolbox that they have to rely on to adapt to changing environments. So for instance, for climate change, um, you know, if, if we have these small isolated populations, 
then inevitably over time will lose a lot of their genetic diversity. And if those fish don't have the right genetic makeup, for instance, for temperature tolerance or whatever it may be, then they, they'll start to hit up against a wall. So that's what we've lost. And, and the idea here is that, you know, since that lake is dried up and those streams have become isolated from their main stem rivers or from lakes, uh, that there's not that gene flow anymore. So we don't have, so basically what you're left with is that old concept that these fish are specializing to one thing because there's no new genes coming in. Across the Lahontan Range, we have very few populations that still have that connectivity. There are a handful of systems. The idea is that we're trying to think about how to move these individuals from one system into another and see how that genetic diversity like helps. In the places that they are persisting, just that little component of genetics management could be a huge boon to the populations because it's, you know, without reconnecting huge river systems, it's a way to maintain that historical process. The ideal is where we can use science to prioritize what we're doing and where we're working and make it more efficient. What it looks like for me is like if, if we've done it, then people care. And these fish just naturally end up on the landscape because there's no alternative that people are willing to accept. Every fish needs an ally, every fish needs an advocate. And they need somebody who's gonna carry that torch and who's gonna be in that position and fight tirelessly. And I mean, for me, the goal is that lending science to the management of this species can help us do better and smarter work on the ground, you know, and so that we'd come back in 30 years and find that these populations that we've been moving, you know, new genetic variation into are thriving better because of the work we did. It's a big issue for the conservation of these fish is trying to make sure that we can keep some of these populations protected and maintain that incredible historical and evolutionary legacy that really just represents everything that's unique about the Great Basin.